Well, hello there, children. Would you like to hear a story? Once upon a time, there was a young man who worked for a small video game company. They made racing games and platformers, but none of them were really successful. In fact, things were so bad that the company was on the edge of bankruptcy. So the man decided to take the last of the money and make one last game. A magical fantasy RPG. And since he believed it was the final game he would ever make, he called it Final Fantasy. But that's not the end of the story. Years later, the same man found himself with a different company and a similar problem. And so once again he chose to make a fantasy RPG. And once again he worked as if it was the final game he would ever make. And that, children, is how he made the last story. The last story follows Elsa, an orphan mercenary who is haunted by the slaughter of his family and dreams of one day becoming a knight. On the other side of the story is Kanan, a sheltered noble betrothed to a man she doesn't love in dreaming of a world outside the castle. Together with Elsa's fellow mercenaries, they try to protect their small island kingdom from invading Gerd forces. Oh, and there's also the little question of why Elsa holds the power of God in his hand, which makes for a pretty good driving mystery. But all in all, the plot is neither revolutionary nor is it overly epic. Yet in a world where every RPG is about saving the world, a more local believable story is a breath of fresh air. Oh sure, all the JRPG cliches are there. Prison escapes, ghost ships, sewer romps, and even a love story. But there are reasons these things became cliché in the first place. If they're done well, like they are in the last story, they're very entertaining. On the JRPG linearity scale, with FF12 on one end and FF13 on the other, the last story finds itself placed firmly in the middle. Every couple of hours you return to the hub island from which you can do a myriad of side quests or revisit previous areas, but large portions of the story are spent fighting through long series of dungeons. So it's no surprise that as soon as you press the start button, you're treated to the standout feature of the last story, the battle system. Gone is any semblance of turn-based gameplay. Instead, there is a new system formed around fast-paced melee combat and explosive magic. Basic combat is simple. When you enter attack range, all you need to do is point the thumbstick at the enemy you want to attack. This allows you to fight groups of enemies with perfect precision. Like in Final Fantasy XII, arcing threads point from enemies to their targets. But unlike FF12, combat is based around Elza's special ability to gather all the enemy threads to himself. From there, you can take the role of a tank and absorb damage, or kite them using obstacles and cover to your advantage. In the meantime, up to six AI companions will be attacking or casting elemental circles, which when combined with Elza's own special attacks, cause massive damage and a myriad of status effects. For those who want a bit more control, with a full magic bar, you can enter the command mode and individually choose targets and attacks. But as the AI is relatively competent, this is only needed in battles where specific spells must be used or when you want to activate one of your AI character's limit break attacks. Most of the bosses are puzzles that require the use of one of Elza's special attacks to defeat them, and with one exception, I'm looking at you giant squid, are easy enough once you figure out the trick. Oddly for a JRPG, there's a heavily featured first person view which is used as both a storytelling technique and as a battle feature. Also on this strange but welcome side, the last story sports two small multiplayer modes, Versus, a 3 on 3 deathmatch, and Raid, a 6 person co-op boss attack. Another highlight is the amount of customization in the last story. Not only can you choose the party's weapons and armor, but you can customize how they look. As you upgrade items, their forms will evolve to reflect their change in power, and best of all, as all the cinematics are rendered in-game, Elza and his friends will always have the same equipment in both cutscenes and battle. In general, the graphics are stunning regardless of whether it's a cutscene, a view of any of the diverse dungeons, or the explosive mix of magical effects mid-battle. On the audio side, the game not only sports an Uematsu scored soundtrack, but is also at least 90% voiced, with the unvoiced lines relegated to only the most meaningless of NPCs. In the end, everything from battle animations and scenic landscapes to the voice acting and soundtrack carry a level of polish rarely seen in the world of HD gaming. Which is why it's even more surprising that the last story is exclusive to the only SD home console of this generation, the Wii. 
But regardless of the console wars, this is not a game any RPG fan should pass up. While the plot is decent, it is the battle system that strives to single-handedly revolutionize how JRPGs are played. Now while there are currently no plans regarding The Last Story's western release, I wouldn't rush into the headache of importing a Wii quite yet. With over 150,000 copies sold in the first five days alone, and the amount of coverage it's been getting from the western press, I'm betting it'll see foreign shores within the coming year. Anyway, I'm Richard Eisenbeis for GameZone.com. Peace out. So, my child, have you finished rolling up the character you'll be on Earth? Yep, I just finished allocating my final skill point. Well, let's see. Dual class in journalism and video games, points in singing, video editing, writing, critical thinking. Now, I understand putting nothing in sports, but are you sure you don't want anything in the visual arts? Oh please, what need would a game journalist ever have for drawing?